Hello everyone and welcome to the course Life in Academia. My name is Miura Anjian Sahalaz. I am from Madagascar and I am a DARA alumnus. So in these videos we will talk to you about different aspects of the academic life. Hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone. My name is Miura. I'm a PhD student at Uppsala University. I am from Madagascar and a few years ago I did my master's at the University of Manchester sponsored by DARA. So this is the first video of a series of videos in life in academia and I will talk about the first step which is doing your PhD. So in this video I will talk about how to apply for a PhD position in astronomy and give you a general overview of what to expect if you are a PhD student. So where do you find open PhD positions? Um, my go-to website is Job Register, so it's at jobregister.aas.org, where you will find uh, most of the open positions in astronomy. So those can be faculty positions, postdoc positions, or engineering positions, and of course PhD positions. So if you scroll down and go to pre-doctoral slash graduate positions, you will see all the um, open PhD positions. You can also find PhD positions elsewhere, for example, in findaphd.com. But as you scroll through those uh, open PhD positions, there are some points that uh, you should uh, carefully read. So you need to consider the advertised project title. So this can be the subject of your PhD. Uh, you have to know that some PhD positions are tied to a particular subject, uh, but some positions can be open, meaning that there is no defined subject yet. Uh, so you have to, to know what kind of uh, PhD position uh, you want to apply for or if you're interested in the subject that is advertised. Uh, you should also consider the university, the supervisor, the deadline and of course the funding. So some PhD positions are funded already so if you apply and if you get the position then you will be guaranteed funding uh, but some PhD positions are competition funded. That means that funding is not guaranteed. But if you apply and if you get the position, you might get funding uh, after you go through some internal competition. So you might get funding. Um, and then some PhD positions can be not funded or not advertised at all. So you can contact a prospective supervisor. You can tell them that you're interested in their work. And then if they're looking for a PhD student and if they agree to work with you, you can apply for external funding to fund your PhD. So where to look for external funding? You can uh, look at funding uh, from the university, so university scholarships. Uh, you can apply for uh, country-specific scholarships. Uh, for example, scholarships that are for Commonwealth countries only, or for Sub-Saharan countries only, or for developing countries. Uh, so you should check if you're eligible for those country-specific scholarships. You can also apply for scholarships from your government, or you can apply for some subject-specific scholarships. Uh, for example, there are scholarships only for physics or scholarships only for uh, uh, science subjects. So you should check as well. Uh, those uh, subject specific scholarships and here I show some uh, uh, some places where you can look for those external funded opportunities. So here are some tips for you if you want to apply for a PhD position in astronomy. I think the first thing is to get an idea of what you want uh, because when you do your PhD, uh, you're going to focus on a particular topic for several years. So it's good if it's something that you're interested in, something that you like. So you should know what you want uh, to do. You should know where you would like to do your PhD because you're likely going to relocate for that. Um, you, get, you should get an idea of what you want, but you should stay flexible. You should know which points are important to you and which points you're willing to compromise on. Another tip is to contact prospective supervisors to show interest and to ask for more information. And this is especially true if you're applying for external funding, as I mentioned earlier, but you can also do it if you uh, apply for an advertised PhD position as well. 
you should customize your CV and cover letter for each position. So you need to highlight the skills that you have that are relevant to the position you're applying to. Those can be programming skills or some softwares that you know how to use or some particular methods like machine learning or statistical methods that you have used before and that you think that are useful for the PhD position you're applying to. And you should also highlight any research experience that you have. And as a DARA basic trainee, you are part of the DARA family, so you should use your DARA network to ask for reference letters, because it's always good to have reference letters written by people that are known in the field. And uh, you need to know that PhDs can be different depending on where you do it. Uh, for example, in terms of duration, uh, in the US, PhDs take uh, more time than in Europe. Uh, the format can also be different. It can be research only, or you can have some courses, or you can have some teaching duties or some mandatory administrative duties. The graduation requirement also differs from country to country and uh, the defense format as well. Uh, so my last advice will be to persevere. Uh, you should consider all your options and use your network and uh, the more you apply then the the higher your chances to get accepted so now that you know how to apply uh, here is an overview for you on what to expect when you are a phd student so in my case i am a phd student in observational astronomy and this is basically what i do so I collect some data, I analyze the data, I process the data, I use some tools on it, uh, and statistical tools, some programming or modeling, and then I do some writing, actually a lot of writing, because reading and writing is a very important part of the life of the PhD student. You read a lot because you need to uh, keep informed and to know uh, to get an overview of the field and you have to write uh, you have to write your thesis you have to write papers that you need to publish so uh, it's going to be this endless cycle where you read you write you give it to your supervisor they give you feedback and then you repeat everything all over again um, Apart from writing, you're going to have to present your research as well. So you're going to have to give talks and present posters. You will have to attend seminars and conferences, not only to share your work, but also to see what all the people are working on and to meet the experts in the field. Uh, and you're going to work a lot with the supervisor and your direct research group, but you have to know that most of your time will actually be independent work. So your computer will be your best friend and you should be familiar with Google because you're going to have to use it a lot and for practically everything. <laughs> Oh, here in my last slide, I talk about uh, the cool and the challenging aspects of uh, doing a PhD. Uh, one cool thing is that you will have flexible hours. Uh, you're not tied to any particular schedule. Of course, it will depend on who you work with and where you work, but uh, most of the time PhD students have flexible hours, uh, which can easily turn into crazy hours so you can develop some unhealthy habits. Uh, so this is something that you have to balance when you do your PhD. Uh, doing a PhD is like uh, doing a marathon, it's a learning process and uh, you're going to take small steps at a time because your PhD is going to be uh, a few years. Uh, but uh, since uh, your goal is in the long term, it can take a while for you before you can see your results. Uh, and it can be a bit frustrating sometimes when you're just working without feeling like you're not, you're not accomplishing anything yet. Uh, another cool thing is that you're going to work with experts and everybody around you will be super smart, uh, which is very nice, but then uh, that means that you're also prone to imposter syndrome, which is very common in academia. As I mentioned earlier, as a PhD student, you work uh, independently most of the time, which sometimes can be, uh, can make you feel a bit isolated. Uh, uh, and you will work on something that you like, which is nice, but uh, it's also important to uh, get outside the bubble of your PhD. Other things that are cool about doing a PhD is that you get to travel a lot, you get to meet uh, a lot of people, make new friends from all over the world. So doing a PhD is really a fulfilling experience and Naomi is going to talk more about this in her video and give you advices on how to deal uh, with uh, the challenges that you face when you do your PhD. 
and uh, in Willis's video, he will talk about what happens next after you do your PhD. So I hope that this video has helped you to uh, uh, have an insight into what it's like to do a PhD in astronomy and give you some tips on how to apply for a PhD position. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Naomi Asabri Frimpong, and I'm going to give you a small talk, the second talk of this um, Life in Academia for Unit 4 cohort. Um, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Manchester, sponsored by the Dara Advanced Training Program. Um, so, yeah, let me pick up my slides and we can have a, a, a short presentation from me. Okay. Academic life, the second half. So you are now a PhD student, but mm -hmm. is it actually going to be a smooth ride? You know that in reality, a PhD life is not a smooth journey, okay? You have days of triumphs and days of utter despair. You have days of clarity. You understand everything you do, you have a focus. You know what you are going to do, but you have days when you are so confused, you have no idea what you are about. You have days when you are so happy and on point, but then you have days where you are tired, you are procrastinating, you cannot even have, you don't have an edge to work. And these are all parts of being a PhD student. You can see from your, your screens, there are valleys, there are hills, there are mountains, there are seas you have to swim. And these are all things you, you should expect as a PhD student, going to your second, going to your third, going to your fourth year, until you reach a finish line, which is when you become a PhD graduate. Now, when you first start a PhD, um, you come in very optimistic. You know, you, you think you're going to finish a PhD in probably three years. Uh, you, have, you have the best PhD ever. Nobody can touch your thesis. When your thesis is finished, you are, is the best of the best. No corrections whatsoever. But then the sharp learning curve that all PhD students go through, which I personally have gone through, lead you to a point where you are like, can I really finish this? You start feeling very, very pessimistic. And then after just when you do your second year, after trying to learn the Python, trying to learn what are coding you have to do, trying to learn, learn all the names of the galaxy or how galaxies work or how stars are born, you know, that's code, that software you can't understand. You now go into a, a, a valley of total despair. Now that's around your second year, which I've been through. I had days when I couldn't even get out of my bed because I did not even know what I'm going to do because what I had done so far that day did not work or that week did not work. It didn't give me the results I wanted. Now at this point, you either crash your van, run from your PhD or just forge ahead. And this is where I don't want you to crash your van. I don't want you to run. I want you to sit yourself down and ask yourself, why am I doing this PhD? Do I have, what am I going to accomplish at the end? Is it beneficial to me? Am I happy doing this? Will I be happy if I have my, my gown on me? Do I have my certificate on me? And let those things be at the forefront of your mind and not give up. When, when you're able to pass through this stage and come out slightly better, you come to a point where you kind of now know what you're about. You're not easily swayed by little problems, little hurdles you meet on your way. And then after your third year, when you start entering towards when you have to write your thesis or your thesis is almost over, you're not, you're in a frenzy, you are, you are energized. You're like, I have to finish this PhD. And you surprisingly, you do finish it. I've gone through all the cycles. And I'm telling you, it's a roller coaster of a journey, but it's so much fun, so challenging, but so satisfying, so fulfilling, I should say. Now, in, in every area of every year of your PhD, you go to a, a phase where after having a meeting with your supervisor, you come up with a new concept, like, what about if you do it like that? What about if we add this, this molecule? What about if we look at this star? What about if you look at it from this angle? And then you go back to your decks and then you are confused again. What did he say? What did he mean? What did she mean? And you're more confused and then you're frustrated. And then you are like, oh, I can't do this. 
then you start asking for help. You start asking people, your colleagues, elder, um, senior PhD students. And finally, at some point, you, the light bulb comes on, okay? You get that idea, you get the understanding, that clarity, and you're like, yes, I can do this. And then you, you feel so accomplished when you do it. I remember one time, I could not figure out what to do with this code. I could not figure out what to do with this software. And I had been working on it for a whole week, so confused. And with just one click of a button, everything worked. And you, you will not imagine the dancing I did that day in my office. If you were there, you would have burst out laughing. Of course, I'm a horrible dancer. And singing with my tone deaf voice, singing and dancing, because I was so happy and so accomplished. Of course, in the end, it was wrong. But that feeling of exhilaration, that feeling of happiness was something, it's something I want you all to experience by yourselves. It's really, really satisfying. Now, to supervisors, there are all kinds of support. I'm not here to tell you about what type of support you get. But as some PhD life is such that you are on the way to being independent. You come out feeling being so independent that you can work by yourself with very little supervision. And that's what they train you, no matter how your supervisor is. In the end, you come out, taking a step, the bold step forward by yourself, not rely on anyone to guide you. And so they, you sometimes you take a problem to the advice and like, oh, okay, um, what do I do with this? And he's like, oh, it's a problem. Yeah, go think about it or go fix it. And you're like, really? That's all you can say? And it's really, that's all you can say because it's actually your PhD. It's actually your topic. You have to come out with a solution to it. He can only guide you in it but then you have to do it by yourself. And so it's, it's really something, some things you feel like he hates you or he doesn't really like you or he's being whatever term you, you give him. But in the end, you come out much, much stronger, a much better person, I, I tell you for sure. Now to the thesis writing process, towards your fourth year, you are or running up your, your work, you have to put stuff down, and the drudgery of going through all the way, the cycle of taking it back and forth with corrections, fixing the corrections, taking it back, finding more, more errors, going back. These are all cycles you experience in your PhD life. And it's, it's a pain, <laughs> but as I said, you come out feeling stronger and happier. Now, when writing your PhD, there, there are many steps you go through. You have to sit down and work. You have to, there's a, a point in time you have to just sit down and write. You can procrastinate, you can panic, you can be in despair, you can just total at some point give up, but you still have to sit down and write. There's a, there's a time we, they, give, they, they gave us in Manchester. I remember in my first year, they told me, you, there's a workshop called Shut Up and Write. And at a point, you just have to shut up. Ignore all the what's all the noise from the outside and just write. Write everything that comes to your mind. You can always correct later. It's always easier to come back and edit what you've done than to write the first words. So just sit down in a chair with your laptop or computer and just write everything you've done. And at some point, you start seeing the story unfold in front of you. One, one most important thing I want to emphasize during a PhD life and even after a PhD life and before a PhD life is to have a mentor. It's one thing going on your own and trying to be independent, but everyone needs a mentor. In what, no matter you decide to be, do a PhD or not, whatever your career choices are after this workshop or after this DARA training, you need a mentor. And a mentor is one of the most fascinating things in a PhD life, like they, they mentor you, of course, they motivate you, they give you advice, they look out for your success, they kind of give you direction, though edging you or like trying to give you the various, various options, but kind of give you other options so you can make a, a right directional like move. They sometimes coach you, they support you, they give you goals that you have to set, milestones you have to overcome, and they also train you. So these are all ways of mentoring and have the mentor. I don't say, I'm not saying you need one mentor for your whole life. It's not possible. One person cannot be a mentor for all your life, no parts. But you do need one for your PhD. You might have one for your married life or your um, social life or whatever. But for a PhD life, I would definitely advise that you get a mentor 
somebody senior in the academic life who has been through the mail and can give you advice and mentor you and guide you through the, the PhD and even afterwards. Um, one way they can help you is um, in your career planning and development, in your work-life balance, writing and presentation, psychological support, networking. I did not really have a definite mentor during my PhD. And I think that really affected me. But I had like a, a, a behind the scenes mentor that I didn't even know I had because every time I had issues, uh, I remember every time I met Professor Melvin Hall, as part of our program, we would really meet at conferences or something. We'll have a sit down and I'll just pour out all my frustrations on him. And I'm sure he has, he will, he will attest to this. I'll pour all my frustrations, all my woes and triumphs. And just a word or two or a few sentences always put me right back on the, on the right track, you know? And it was really, really helpful. And the end, towards the end of my PhD, I got a, like a, a, like a, a mentor, someone I said, can you mentor me? And, and she was happy to do so. And I've, I've really benefited so much from it. So I urge you all to consider having a mentor and doing whatever, in whatever area of your life, I'll say. Whether you decide to do a PhD in astronomy or not, or pursue some other career, I will advise you to have a mentor. Now I will end my talk here and I'll hand over to Willis to continue with um, after a PhD life, what, what, what next? And I look forward to all your success and I hope you all make it have the most successful um, future careers possible. Thank you and let me stop sharing and say a proper goodbye. <laughs> so have a fruitful um, training and enjoy the Dara experience. I've enjoyed it and I've, I've really benefited from it. And I hope you all take something crucial or important from these talks that you are listening to and these trainings. All the best and I hope to see you soon if COVID doesn't keep us locked up forever. Okay, bye. Hello everyone, I'm Wele Sobonio from Kenya and uh, Adara alumni. I just want to share with you my academic journey. I did a Bachelor of Education Science uh, here in Kenya, in Mo University. That was between 2002 and 2006. After that, I taught in a Kenyan high school for five years and while teaching, I registered for a master's uh, uh, in physics in Mo University on part-time basis. Uh, after the master's, I wanted to proceed to a PhD, but I didn't get an opportunity immediately. And then a wonderful opportunity arose to study astrophysics and transition from nuclear physics to astrophysics and space science. And I call this a wonderful opportunity because I had heard of uh, a telescope, uh, a telescope that was being to be built in Kenya, that is on long on Earth, Earth station was supposed to be converted into a radio telescope. And so I studied a master of physics, astrophysics and space science at uh, University of Cape Town between 2013 and 2014, and then graduated in 2015. Uh, now, while waiting for my graduation in 2015, <clears throat> DARA project uh, invited applicants for basic training and I applied. And I think this was a wonderful opportunity because apart from just uh, transitioning from nuclear physics to astrophysics. Now I was going specifically for radio astronomy. And that is how I came from uh, optical astrophysics where I studied using optical telescope to uh, radio astronomy where I am today. And this is just uh, me in 2015 on top of Hatrao, one of the antennas in Hatrao uh, there. Now, after my basic training, I went to the University of Leeds for advanced training, that is PhD in astrophysics. Uh, while there, I studied massive star formation and specifically was looking at the radio properties of massive stars that drive out materials or jets. Now, this is one of the massive protostars that I studied. It's called W3 IRS5. And what you see here are materials that are ejected from uh, the protostar itself, which is down here. And as the materials go away, this 
our protester here is also doing what is called precession, and that is why we have this pattern which looks uh, like a, a wave here that is increasing in amplitude. After PhD, I had an opportunity in placement at the University of Manchester as an intern in uh, what is called scientific computing. I did this for six months between February 2020 to July 2020. After the internship, I came back home here in Kenya and decided to rest for around four months. And while resting, I applied for positions. Uh, and I applied for different positions, including postdocs. And then I got a lecturing position at uh, the Technical University of Kenya. That is where I am currently. I also just want to share life after a research degree, master's, uh, PhD. And uh, uh, here, immediately after your research degree, you have other options to explore. So it can either be in an academic career, which largely depends on your skills, personality, and preferences, or it could be in academia. That is career in science to continue with it. Either you can decide to continue the same field as your PhD, as a postdoc or purely research position, or choose something else that is new to you and, and, and exciting uh, uh, to you. Uh, so if, if it's a postdoc, then it will mostly largely research. Also, you can opt for lectureship position and, uh, and do research. So now that uh, some of you may just be starting or just doing their masters, after that, you can decide on any of these options. And there are a lot of skills that you've learned, uh, including computing skills. And, and analytical skills that you can use uh, to, uh, to join other careers. Now, I just want to share something that I think is quite interesting and that Dara has really worked on uh, uh, very heavily, and that is the power of networking. And uh, before I come to Dara, I just want to mention that uh, for me to apply for the MSc in Astrophysics and Space Science, a friend of mine with whom we studied a uh, Master of Science in Physics shared the email, and that is how I applied. So I got this opportunity or this bursary because a friend that I had known, one of my networks, shared it. Then the basic training, how did I join basic training? I joined basic training because a friend that I met in Cape Town and who is currently in Nairobi University as a lecturer shared uh, the advert on Facebook. So it was shared on, on different platforms, but he shared it on Facebook, Facebook, and that is how I saw the advert got interested and saw an opportunity to transition from optical astronomy to radio astronomy because it's becoming more popular in, in Africa. That is how I joined it. Thereafter, I went to University of Leeds. And how did I get the information? I got the information when it was shared to me by a DARA alumni. So there's one of my friends that we were with at the DARA basic training, and he shared the information to me. And that is how I applied and got the opportunity. How did I get the internship position at the University of Manchester? I got it because uh, I had met Professor Anna Scaife, who gave me an opportunity to learn new skills that I had not learned at the University of Leeds, especially in computing. And that is also because of the network we had met uh, uh, at uh, a conference. Also, the position that I hold today, which is lecturing at Technical University of Kenya, how did I get it? I got the information from Dara contact person here in Kenya, and then I applied through him because he happened to be uh, the head of department at that point, at that time. So what am I saying? The contacts you make, to, you make, you make today are going to be very instrumental in your future progress. And Dara has been very helpful in this. There is annual networking meeting where you meet uh, fellow Dara trainees as well as advanced uh, uh, students and, 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 uh, and uh, the lecturers and supervisors and potential supervisors. So you should take these opportunities uh, uh, very carefully, very seriously. Another thing that I just want to mention is that uh, you are a lucky group compared to our group. In our group, we were taught by two uh, lecturers. And uh, so we, share, we, we had all the two weeks with them. But I think you are going to listen to lectures from different uh, uh, lecturers uh, and, and supervisors. 
So it means therefore that you're going to know a lot more people than we know, we knew, and uh, you are going to have a wide uh, range of choice for future reference letters. So you are very lucky group, even though there is COVID. Thank you very much and enjoy. Hello everyone, um, Naomi here again. I hope you enjoyed all the different presentations you have had this, for this session. Um, I hope they helped you in some way. I'm sure we have not covered everything you need to know. So um, we are still here for any questions. Um, Jack and Rob and all the other tutors are available for any questions you want to ask about PhD life and life after PhD. So yeah, uh, put your questions in the live chats or in the Q&A questions in Slack and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you put there and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Have a good day.